Uh, today I want to talk to you about a subject that we're seeing not only individuals, but churches have the problem with. And that is drifting. We're seeing a lot of churches, denominations, and when I say that, that is all denominations. They're starting to drift away from what they were believing in when they started. And not only churches, but individuals are starting to drift away from what the Word of God says and what we need to do. I think we all agree that we could ne we never dreamed life would get as busy as it has gotten. Really? I mean, I can hear those who are retired, and I'm one of them now, and I can hear them say, I seem to be busier than when I worked. The world is at a rapid pace today. Fast, just fast, fast, fast. All these inventions that come up that was going to give us more time to rest, like a washing machine, like a dryer, didn't no longer have to run out there and fight the rain that's coming to get mama's clothes off the line or, or go out there when it's freezing cold and break them down because they're frozen stiff. Microwave ovens that were going to give us quicker time to fix our food. But what we've done with all this new time is filled it up with even more stuff. It's run, it, it, what happens is mom and dad are working now. Nothing wrong with that. Then one takes a kid to soccer on that side of town. One takes another kid to dance on that side of town. Then it's run by pick up something for supper, rush on, get the kids through homework, get them into bed before it gets too late. Mom and dad sit back and relax for just a moment before they go to bed. And lo and behold, they all need to wake up and do it all over again tomorrow. Now there's nothing wrong with any of that. Sports is great. I think sports teaches kids how to work together, play together. You're not going to always win. There's times when you're going to lose. Sports is great. But as you look at that, where's the time that we should spend with God? Where's the time that we should spend reading His Word? Where's the time that we should spend praying and talking to Him? We're exhausted. There's nothing wrong with any of that. I have found out in my life that when I put God first in the morning, pray, read His Word, the rest of my day seems to go better. Then if I wake up in a rush, I'll do it later, and later never comes. I can, I can vouch for that. But I want to spend a few moments today talking about drifting and how easy it is, even for the strongest Christian in this building today, it is very easy to begin to drift. If you got your Bibles and you want to turn to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. We know not who wrote the book of Hebrews. Some said maybe Paul. Others say we don't know. But in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard Lest we drift away. Lest we drift away. Look at this verse. Let's look at it and, and let's, let's see what it's telling us. What does it mean to drift? When does drifting start? When does it begin? Like I said earlier, we wake up today, we're too busy trying to rush, get breakfast get the kids up for school, get to work on time. We're rushing, we're rushing, we're rushing. And when we get to work, we realize we have not read or prayed. Well, I'll do it later today when I get back home. And again, we get tied up in things in life. We get busy. And when we sit down to do it, we're so tired. I've almost fell asleep sometimes reading the Bible, and I think I have fell asleep once or twice praying. You just wake up, you're exhausted. Drifting starts very slowly. <clears throat> it is almost like an unconscious happening. We're not even aware of it. It takes no life. It takes no effort on our part. We just float. How many have you ever been out on a boat in the, in the lake and you just let it drift? It can, kind of gets relaxing. You can sit back and just almost fall asleep, let it rock you to sleep. The same thing happens in our spiritual life. And this writer here is warning the readers that we must take the teachings of God seriously. 
If we don't read the Word of God and we don't study it with a desire to learn and know more about what we must do and what we must not do, we could find ourselves like a boat that has broken away in a storm from a dock. It just begins to float wherever the tide takes it. We are warned in God's Word that the world, the cares of this world, the deceptions of riches and the pursuit of material things and the pleasures of sin causes us to choke the Word of God in our lives and causing us to forget Him, to stop daily prayers, to stop daily ringing, praying, and no longer delight in the Word of God. Look at Mark chapter 4, verse 19. He warns us of this. He tells us right here in the book of Mark. <clears throat> he says, In the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the desires for other things entering in, choke the Word, and it becomes unfruitful. It can, you know, you ever heard the story, they say they could take a frog and put it in a pot of water and just turn it on a little bit. The water gets a little hot, but the frog don't realize any danger's happening. He don't try to get out. You know, warm water feels better than the cold water. And so they turn it up a little bit more. And he gets used to it. Turn it up a little bit more. He gets used to it. Until it's too late to get out of the water and he dies. Folks, the same thing can happen to us today. I don't care how long you've been serving the Lord. It don't matter how long you maybe be active in a church. If we don't do a daily maintaining our relationship with God, we begin to drift. It's just like a marriage. A man and his wife, if they slowly begin to stop talking to one another, stop doing things together, stop working together, we begin to drift apart. Friends do the same thing. It can happen to you and I with God. We need to know that we have to be careful and pay attention to what is going on. The point here is there's no standing still in living for God. My granddaddy, who was a pastor and a preacher, used to tell me, Russell, when it gets to the point that you're standing still for God, you're going forward or you're going backwards. You're not standing still. That's why you and I must do everything within our power to stay close to God. Like a river that's flowing, it can take you from where you want to be to somewhere you don't want to be. And that's further away. The world today can lure us into a drifting condition very easily if we take our eyes off of Jesus. In this day in which we live, there is so much out there to draw us away from God, to turn our attention away from God to turn our attention from being in church when the doors are open. If we're not careful today, we drift towards compromise. Listen to this now. We drift toward compromise and we call it tolerance. This is happening so much today and not only in individuals, but in denominations. They're drifting from where they used to be, from where the founders put this world together, put this country together, put denominations together. We call it tolerance, the ability or willingness to tolerate something that we used to wouldn't tolerate. We used to wouldn't say it was okay to do. It was not the right thing to do. The Word of God says it's wrong. But now they want to tolerate it. This is happening today at a large alarming rate. We're seeing denominations change their belief. They're taking what this says is wrong. And they're saying, well, you know, it ain't quite as bad as we thought it was. I think it's okay. We can live with it. Folks, that's a lie from the devil. You can't change this. If the book says it's a sin when they formed the United States and when they formed the churches that are in the United States, it's still a sin today. We can't say it's okay now. It's tolerable. Don't want to hurt nobody's feelings. Can't do that. The church today and us as individuals, and I'm included, we're letting the world tell us what to believe instead of what God's Word says. We can't do that. Church leaders are given in to the world and is wrong. Nobody has the power here on this earth to change the Word of God. You can't do it. We drift towards disobedience and call it freedom. The devil convinces people that the commandments of God are so hard. And if you live for God in this day and time and you've got to go to church and you've got to do this and you've got to do that, that's not fun. That's what the world is convincing the people today, that church is no longer fun. 
that serving God has no happiness in it, no joy in it. It's just a burden to try to walk around and live a godly life. Hey, I found out if you really love something, and if you really love it, you're going to do it no matter what. I believe that. And we've got to be careful to not let the devil convince us that being a part of church, being a part of God's kingdom is not fun. I've got the joy of the Lord in my heart, folks. I can have a bad day and still be good. I can have a bad day and still have fun. I can have a bad day and still say, praise the Lord. He's, he's protecting me. He's providing for me. He's taking care of me. Some Christians think we need to make changes so I can be free. Folks, I don't want to be free if it takes me from God. I want to make heaven my home one day. I want to do what I got to do to make it in. If I got to withstand by myself, I'm going to do it. That's my goal, to live for God. It's not hard. It's not, it's not hatred. It's not bad. First John says, for this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. In other words, they're not hard. If we love God with all our heart, we're going to live by those commandments so easily. You know, it's like taking... I was thinking how I, what I could compare this to. And, and uh, I think one of the worst things that we have to do now as adults, especially on up in age a little bit, is try to go on a diet. You know, you don't realize how bad you want something until you ain't supposed to have it. We think, man, if i got to go on a diet, you know. And Angie will tell you, sometimes I have went on diets and I've lost weight, but I'm one of the most miserable people to be around even though I know I'm doing myself some good. I don't like it because I can't eat what I want to. But if I want to lose the weight, if the doctor tells me I need to lose the weight, it's so much easier to do. I don't want to make it hard to live for God. I've never found it hard to live for God. I don't have all good days. i got bad days. But God said, hey, many are the afflictions of the righteous, the psalmist said, but my God delivereth from them all. Yeah, we're going to have bad days. The Bible said many are the afflictions. They're going to come. It says here, we shall have no other gods before me. We find it easy if we'll keep God first in our life. Folks, it is so easy to let something take God's place in our life. If you look at the commandments, it says you shall have no other God before me. And you say, well, what do you mean? I don't have an idol. If you've got something in your life today, that's keeping you from church. That's keeping you from serving God. That's, that is your idol. Man. That is your number one. And this world today is filled with people who no longer have God number one in their life. God says, if you're going to love me, I've got to be number one. We drift towards superstition and call it faith. I know today there was people that woke up, went and got the newspaper and turned it over to the horoscope to see how their day was going to be. Well, I can't go outside today. Why not? Says I'm going to get hit by a car. I can't go out today. Why? It says this bad thing's going to happen if I go to town. Folks, don't put your faith in that. Don't put your faith in that. There are those who would rather trust old fables and old wise tales from the past than to trust what this word says. I like this word. It says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, but I'll go with you all the way. I'll supply your need. Take no thought of tomorrow what you might eat, what you might wear. I already know what you have need of before you even begin to ask. Just ask anything in my name and you shall have it. I like this part. I like this part. I'd rather have that than with that other. We cherish, self, we cherish the indiscipline of self-control. And we call it relaxation. We drift towards prayerlessness. And now we say, when I have the time. If nothing else gets in the way, I'll pray. A lot of people have made God the God they pray to only when they need to. I want to praise Him, pray with Him some days and just thank Him. There's days I say, Lord, I'm not going to ask for a thing today. I just want to thank You for all You've already done. And I just praise Him and thank Him. But yet there's people today, and I, I had a statistic, and I don't have it with me this morning, of people that say, God is basically, I, he's on the shelf, but when I need him, I'll take him down and pray to him. Folks, it don't work that way. It don't work that way. C.S. Lewis said, as a matter of fact, if you examine a hundred people who have lost their faith in Christianity, I wonder how many of them would have turned out to have been reasoned out of it 
by an honest argument, do not most people simply just drift away? Just drift away. Therefore, we must give close attention to God's Word, our relationship to Christ, and the leading of the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit's there to guide us, but it's there to correct us. It's there to prick our heart when we begin to do something that we no longer want to do or should do. And folks, I can stand up here this morning and testify because I know for a fact it is easy to drift away from church. Because after I gave my heart and life to the Lord and served Him for several years, I began to drift away. I began to let other things fill my time with God. But thank God I came back. I'm thankful today that I came back to Him. But it is so easy because neglect, carelessness, and our unconcern is fatal. We have warned in this in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 and 17. This I say, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth after the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. We cannot beat the flesh on our own. This is an enemy that we have, and we're going to have it until God takes us home to be with Him. We need the Holy Spirit. We need God in us. We need an active prayer life to overcome what this flesh wants us to do. The great apostle Paul said, I find myself doing the things I shouldn't do and failing to do the things that I should do. And if a man of Paul's standard in relationship with God cannot fight the flesh and win, what makes us today think that we can? We can't do it. And if we're not careful, this flesh will begin to defeat us and pull us away from God. A believer who wants, who because of negligence, allows the truth and the teachings of the gospel to slip is in peril of being swept downstream past a fixed landing place. All Christians are tempted to become indifferent to God's Word because of carelessness and unconcern. We may easily begin to pay less attention to God's warnings, cease to persevere in our struggle against sin, and begin to drift. Backsliding or drifting doesn't happen overnight. I don't care what, it does not happen overnight. How many of us in here today, don't raise your hand, but how many of us in here today can name somebody that we know at one time was so active in the church, so strong in the church, in the church every time the doors open and they could be there, maybe teaching a class, maybe leading the singing, maybe doing great works in the church, but they're no longer seen in church anywhere. Because they begin to drift away. And now they never come into a church. They never talk about the Lord. They never talk about being saved. They never talk about once knowing the Lord. Life got busy. And it began to take them away. We used to preach to our children. When they were young. Growing up. And then after they got out and went to college. We would preach to them. Church is one of the. For the lack of another word, it's one of the easiest habits to break and quit and one of the hardest to pick back up. Because you know why once you break the habit of going to church and you begin to lay out maybe two Sundays, then you go back, then you lay out two or three more Sundays, and you say, well, I need to get back in church. The devil said, well, if you go back now, they're going to talk about you. Must be in trouble. Must need help from the church. Look at them, they're back. Hey, listen, they're they going to talk about you anyway. Stay in church. Listen, the devil will do everything within his power to draw us away. I heard this the other day. And it took, I, I read it several times, but boy, does it make sense. The more you miss church, the less you miss church. Think about it. The more you stay away, the easier it becomes to stay away. The more you quit reading God's Word, the less you miss it. The more you fail to pray, you don't miss it as quite as bad as you first started. And if it gets to the point that we can't feel the Holy Spirit trying to tug at us and say, hey, you're not where you were, you're not, you ain't supposed to be here, you're supposed to be back over on this side. There was a gentleman in England one time, I can't remember his name, but it don't care how much you come over to his house. If you was over at his house and it got to like 8 or 8.30, 9 o'clock, he would stand up and say, stay as long as you want. I'm going to bed. It's time for all good men to be in bed. 
because I got to get up in the morning at an early hour to spend time with my father before I go back to whatever whatever he done for a living. He just leave you sitting in the living room. You know, show your way out. That's the way he took it. Satan begins to make other things so inviting if we're not careful. There was a group that's still singing today called the Kingsman Quartet. Great quartet, some great men have sung in that group. Years ago, they had a song that some of you may have heard. Excuses. And it says, excuses, excuses, you hear them every day. And the devil, he'll supply them if from church you stay away. When people come to know the Lord, the devil always loses. So to keep them folks away from church, he offers them excuses. And listen to these excuses now. Well, it's summertime, it's too hot. And the wintertime, it's too cold. Oh, but when the springtime, when the weather's just right, we'll find some place else to go. It's up to the mountains or down to the beach to visit some old friends or just stay home. I kind of hope some people start dropping in. The church benches are way too hard and the choir sings way too loud. But you know, boy, how nervous you get when you're sitting in a crowd. The doctors told you, now you better watch them crowds, they'll set you back. But you go to that old ball game because they say it helps you to relax. A headache Sunday morning and a backache Sunday night. But oh, come Monday morning, you're feeling okay. You're all right. While one of the children has a cold, this is my favorite part of the song. Pneumonia, you suppose. But the whole family had to stay home just to help that kid blow his nose. <laughs> the preacher, he's too young. Maybe he's too old. The sermons, they're not hard enough. Or maybe he's too bold. His voice is much too quiet. Like Sometimes it gets too loud. He needs to have more dignity or else he's much too proud. Folks, the sermons may be too, too long or maybe they're too short. He ought to preach the word with dignity instead of stomp and snort. Well, that preacher, you might say, is the world's most stuck up man. Why, just the other day, a lady told me he wouldn't even shake her hand. All those are excuses that the devil offers to us. Now I know sometimes when we're on vacation, we're gonna might not be at church, and that's fine. Some days we have to work. When my son-in-law asked for my daughter's hand in marriage, I told him, son, you got two things I want you to do. Number one, you provide and you take care of her. And number two, when the church doors are open, you're in church. If you're not having to work, you're not sick or you're on vacation, you have my daughter in church. If you'll do them two things, you can have her hand in marriage. I think they've been married 15, 16 years now. And you know what they're doing this morning? They're running the sound at the church they go to. First Sunday, he called my daughter up after, before they got married. He called her up at her house and said, hey, I'm coming over. We're going to church. He said, I don't feel like. He said, I promise you did to get ready. <laughs> We're going to church. So, we cannot sit on the pew of do nothing. And I've already said that. The spiritual battle will continue as long as we're here on earth. And you and I today must be ready to fight. We can't fight by ourselves. We must fight with God on our side and with the Holy Spirit on our side. But the choice is yours to make today and every day from here on out. If we will yield to the demands of the Holy Spirit, continue under the dominations of Christ, or we surrender to, surrender to the inclinations of the flesh, and we'll return to sin. The choice is ours today to make. The only way to avoid is to remain anchored in Christ and let Him be the pilot of your ship today. In closing, I want to read something from you that was back said in back in the 60s, that long ago, but yet it is so real today. Listen to what, and most of you probably heard this from Paul Harvey. Remember Paul Harvey? He would come on there and tell you a short little part about what he was going to talk about, and then he'd say, go to commercial, and he'd come back and he'd say, now, the rest of the story. Now, Paul Harvey said this back in the 60s, and you tell me how much it lines up with what we're seeing today in this country and in this world. Paul Harvey said, If I were the devil, I would gain control of the most powerful nation in the world. That's us. I would dilute their minds into thinking that they had come from man's efforts instead of God's blessings. 
I would promote an attitude of loving things and using people instead of the other way around. I would dupe entire states into relying on gambling for their state revenue. I would convince people that character is not an issue when it comes to leadership. I would make it legal to take the life of unborn babies. I would make it socially acceptable to take one's own life and invent machines to make it convenient. I would cheapen human life as much as possible so that life of animals are valued more than human beings. I would take God out of the schools where even the mention of his name was grounds for a lawsuit. I would come up with drugs that sedate the mind and target the young. I would get sports heroes to advertise them. I would get control of the media so that every night I could pollute the mind of every family member for my agenda. I would attack the family, the backbone of any nation. I would make divorce acceptable and easy, even fashionable. If the family crumbles, so does the nation. I would compel people to express their most depraved fantasies on campus, movie screens, and call it art. I would convince the world that people are born homosexuals and that their lifestyle should be accepted and marveled. I would convince people that right and wrong are determined by a few who call themselves authorities and have their agenda as politically correct. I would persuade the people that, have, that the church is irrelevant, out of date, and the Bible is for the naive. I would dull the mind of Christians, make them believe that prayer is not important, and that faithfulness and obedience are optional. And then he closed it out by saying, I guess I just leave things pretty much as they are. He could tell back then where this country was headed. And folks, we're there now. And it's getting worse every day. And if we're not careful, the devil can easily convince us there's no danger in doing this. There's no danger in going there. There's no danger in not going to church today. There's no danger in not reading the Word. Folks, there's danger when we leave God out of the picture. So today I urge you as I'm closing, don't let the devil take you out of church. Don't let the devil take you away from the Bible. Don't let the devil take you from praying. Lord knows our families need prayer. Our children see our children today, and I, I, I worry. What worries me the most about passing on and going on home to be with the Lord? My children are grown; they're in their forties. I worry about my grandson. What's the world going to be like when he gets up to be an adult? What's he going to have to face? What is he going to have to put up with? And I'm not going to be here. We need to pray now more for the family than we ever have in our in our country. We need to pray more for churches today than we ever have. Not just in their own denomination, but churches across the board. We're seeing what happened to the Episcopalians. We're seeing what happened to the Presbyterian. We're seeing now what's going on with the Methodists. Who's to say what's next? If the devil can tear us apart, and believe me, if you're a child of God today, you've got a target on your back that the devil is trying to get to. What we've got to do is stay faithful, stay strong in the Word, strong in church and active in church. To today. Let's make sure if you find yourself that you are drifting, God's standing with open arms to take you back. He doesn't ever get rid of you. If you find you're still strong in the Lord, stay strong in the Lord. Don't stop praying. Don't stop reading the Word. Don't stop going to church. Please, today, we need more people like you that's right here this morning doing this again Wednesday night, doing this again next Sunday. And better inviting people to come with us. I encourage you. I'm, I'm not, I don't know when I'll be back and whatever the case may be, but I urge you, as I taught our Sunday school class sometimes, invite somebody during this week to come be in church with you. Don't go pick somebody out of another church. It's like I heard a preacher, a preacher say one time, he didn't want other preachers fishing in his pond, and he wasn't going to go fish in their pond. He wants them to go fish in the pond where the people are that don't go to church. But if you know somebody that's not in church today, invite them to be with you here next week. And invite them, tell them, hey, I'm, I ain't never been there. I'll sit with you. Come sit with me. 
Because the more people we can get in church. You know, people say, oh, it's not about numbers. To me, it is. Every number that we have in here is a soul that needs Jesus. I, I don't, if it's 300 people, praise God, we got 300 souls here today that needs to hear about the love of Christ. Numbers do matter. We need to get all the people we can to go to heaven with us. And I want to take as many as I can. God's got plenty of room. He's got plenty of room. 1,500 miles high, 1,500 miles wide. Hey, that's a lot of room. If he needs more, he'll make it. He needs to God, the creator of all. If you would, let's stand as they come to play this last song. I'll be up here if you want prayer. I'll be glad to pray with you. If you want to come to the altar and pray by yourself, please do. You can pray right where you're at. But ask God to strengthen you, keep you in, in line with His Word, keep you on your knees in prayer, keep you talking to Him and maintaining that communication as they sing.